CMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. It is 7.32 p.m. on Tuesday, July 9th, 2024. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I'd like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Venkat Holly. Here. Daniel Riccadelli. Here. And Adam LeBlanc. Here. And Ms. Hoffman is traveling and can't join us this evening. Um, here from the town, we have our zoning assistant, Colleen Ralston. Here. Good to have you with us. And with us, we also have town council, Michael Cunningham. Here. Good to have you with us. Uh, and then checking in on the hearing for this evening, uh, appearing for docket 3802, uh, 296 Washington Street, uh, Shay Cronin and Amy Farrell. We're here. Good to have you with us. Uh, for docket 3805, 232 Massachusetts Avenue, uh, Lisa Cronin and Adaria Realty Trust. Uh, Michael Corey, counsel for the applicant. Perfect, thank you. He's here as well. Uh, for docket 3806-109 Wright Street uh, with Eric Legault and Jessica Chouquette. Here. We are here. Good to have you with us. And appearing for docket 3807-39 Amherst Street, we have Scott Smith. Here. Good to have you with us. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act making appropriations for the fiscal year 2023 to provide for supplementing certain existing appropriations and for certain other activities and projects signed into law on March 29, 2023. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2025, the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location, so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. And as chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. As the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. Whereas the, zoning, whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the town of Arlington, Massachusetts, discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotomy, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. Uh, just a notice on procedures. At the end of the discussion of each individual hearing, the board will vote to either continue the public hearing to a specific date to continue receiving testimony on the matter, or the board will vote to close the public hearing, ending new, the receipt of new testimony. The board will then proceed to the next item on the agenda. Over the coming days, the board will prepare a draft decision based on the testimony received and the discussions that took place during the public hearing. And that discussion decision, excuse me, will be voted on at the next available meeting of the board. In practical terms, for those hearings before the board this evening, there will not be an official vote for or against your project this evening. That vote will take place at our next available meeting when we have a draft decision to review and upon which our vote will rest. But moving on to administrative items. Uh, these items relate to the final votes on applications before the board. 
and the operation of the board and as such will generally be conducted without input from the general public. The board will not take up any new business on any prior hearings, nor will there be the introduction of any new information on matters previously brought before the board. So going to the online agenda, this brings us to item two on our agenda, which is the vote on the decision for 84 Hillside Avenue. Uh, this is a decision um, that was co-written by myself and Mr. Hanlon, uh, presented to the board for questions and comments. And the final decision was posted uh, by email to the members this afternoon. Are there any additional questions or comments in regards to the uh, final decision for 84 Hillside Avenue? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon? Mr. Let me defer to Mr. Riccardelli. Uh, so uh, for the beginning of the I was um, not on the Zoom call, so we filled out a Mullen form, and I did watch the recording and listen to the recording of that hearing. Great, thank you. So, um, so Mr. Riccadelli is up to date in terms of the hearings and is available for vote on this matter. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, the... Uh, the uh, <clears throat> the the opinion in this case recites the people who were present and the people who were absent and notes that Mr. Riccardelli was actually both, uh, and uh, it needs to include both. He needs to be included both on the cover, and on the uh, uh, and on the list of uh, and the fact that he filled out a Mullen form ought also to be included in the in the text. So I would propose that the board consider those changes to the language that it has reviewed and has before it. Thank you. Are there any additional changes or um, adjustments to this decision? No. Seeing none, the chair will ask for a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, I, I move that the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, for the town of Arlington approves and adopts the written decision in 84 Hillside Avenue, which grants a special permit with conditions under sections 3.3 .3 and 6.1.10a of the zoning bylaw, uh, as has been amended in the course of the meeting uh, hitherto. And further, I move that the members of the Zoning Board of Appeals of the Town of Arlington hereby authorize the duly elected chair of the board to sign this decision and attest that it was duly adopted by the appropriate vote of the board. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Second. The roll call vote of the board uh, to accept, uh, approve, and adopt the written decision for 84 Hillside Avenue. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. The chair votes aye. That decision is approved. That moves us to the next on our agenda, item number three, uh, which is the written decision for 40 Sutherland Road. Uh, this was a decision that was written by Mr. Hanlon, uh, distributed to the board for questions and comments, and a final version posted to the board via email this afternoon. Are there any additional questions or comments in regard to the written decision for 40 Sutherland Road? Seeing none, the chair will accept a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, I move that the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington approves and adopts the written decision in 40 Sutherland Road, which grants a special permit with specified conditions under sections 3.3 and 8.1.3b of the zoning bylaw. Second. Excuse me, I that wasn't I paused before I was quite through. Uh, I would like to add the members of the Zoning Board of Appeals hereby authorize the duly elected chair of the board to sign this decision and attest it was duly adopted by the appropriate vote of this board. Thank Second. you, Mr. Hanlon. Second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So this is a vote of the board to accept the approve and adopt the written decision for 40 Sutherland Road. Uh, roll call vote of the board, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. The chair votes aye. That decision is approved. That brings us to item four on our agenda, which is the uh, final decision on 322 Mystic Street. Uh, this was a decision that I wrote, um, distributed to the board for questions and comments, and a, a final version emailed uh, earlier this evening to members of the board. Are there any 
final questions or comments in regards to the decision for 322 Mystic Street? Seeing none, the chair will accept a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I move that the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington approves and adopts the written decision in 322 Mystic Street, which denies a petition for variance under Section 3.2.2D of the Zoning Bylaw and Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A, Section 10. The members of the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, of Arlington hereby authorize the duly elected chair of the board to sign this decision and attest that it was duly adopted by appropriate vote of the board. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Thank you, Mr. DuPont for the second. So this is a vote of the board to accept the written decision for 322 Mystic Street. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. Chair votes aye. That decision is approved. That brings us to the public hearings for this evening. Before opening tonight's meeting for public hearings, here are some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. After I announce each agenda item, I will ask the applicant to introduce himself or themselves and make their presentation to the board. I will then request that the members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposal. After the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. At the conclusion of public comment, the board will deliberate and vote to either continue or to close the public hearing. All votes will be conducted by roll call vote. The final vote on any matter before the board will be taken at a subsequent meeting once the written decision has been drafted and provided to the board. The decision will then be filed with the town clerk starting the 20-day appeal period under state law. After that time, the applicant may proceed with their building permit. However, under state law, no decision granted by this board shall take effect until a certified copy of the final decision has been filed with and recorded at the Middlesex South Registry of Deeds in Cambridge by the applicant. So with that, um, I will be uh, taking an item out of order. I would like to proceed with item six on our agenda, which is docket 3805-232 Massachusetts Avenue. It's a continuance from a prior hearing, although we did not receive any testimony at that prior hearing. It's, it was essentially a delayed opening for the hearing. So with that, um, I would turn to Mr. Corey to um, introduce the matter to the board. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, Michael Corey, uh, I am counsel to uh, Nilcant 232 Inc., um, the proposed tenant and operator of the proposed liquor store. Um, uh, just to, by way of background, the select board, after receiving uh, reports and analysis from uh, the police department, the fire department, the health department, and other um, other uh, departments of the town, uh, approved the issuance of a liquor license for this location uh, in favor of Nil Camp 232 uh, back in roughly this time last year. Uh, the um, decision then went to the state's Alcohol Beverage Control Commission and was approved. Um, in the course of uh, in the course of that process, uh, we were negotiating with the landlord, uh, representative of which is here, uh, Mr. Cronin, um, uh, the terms of a lease agreement and got agreement on that lease. Um, we discovered that um, while the building is grandfather, the building is located in a residential six district, um, which does not allow by right or special permit uh, commercial retail uh, operations. The property, though, was built in 1930 and was um, operated as a, it's a one-story, four-unit commercial building um, that was, um, uh, that has, is, is accordingly grandfathered. It, that um, its use was, predates uh, the restrictions on the residential six district. Um, so uh, we had uh, discussed it with the uh, building commissioner as well as the select board. And we were advised that we needed to seek a variance, a use variance under section two of the bylaw uh, from uh, this board uh, in order to allow for that. The grandfathered status of, the, uh, of this unit, although not the building, um, uh, was lost uh, due to the most recent tenant, a dry cleaner, vacating 
uh, in June or July of 2021, um, the landlord and that that departure was left. Uh, was, that, that departure was a result of um, you know COVID um, COVID fallout. Um, the landlord vigorously marketed the property um, uh, for a new tenant, uh, and uh, we, um, my client, uh, Nilcant Two Thirty Two, uh, uh, it, um, we reached an agreement with them, subject to our obtaining a liquor license, which we have from the uh, town and the ABCC, and now, of course, um, your. Um, a variance uh, to allow the continued grandfathered status of the property. Um, uh, again, I want to note my client's representative, Yashika Patel, would be here, but she gave birth to a girl yesterday. Oh, didn't want to bother her. Congratulations to them. <laughs> she had enough to deal with. Um, <laughs> um, so if, if I could take you through uh, what the property involves, and then I, if you like, I can... Uh, present for the record the argument that we put in the uh, uh, in the application for the use variance. Well, the, yeah. So the the real crux of the question is the the question of the use variance. Yes. So under state law, a use variance is only allowed if a town specifically adopts it and includes right. it in their zoning bylaws. And I do not see anything in our zoning bylaw that explicitly allows a variance for use. Um, now we were advised in section two, bear with me for one second. Um, the so section two is the section on, on definitions. Right. Um, and the, um, okay. Uh, Okay, so um, if the variance says a departure from the term is a variance is defined in the bylaw as a departure from the terms of the bylaws the Board of Appeals may authorize. And then if you go to definitions associated with use, um, it uh, uh, we were advised that the definitions as specified there um, allowed for a use variance under uh, Chapter uh, 40A. Section 10. Um, we had been speaking with the uh, building commissioner for some time. Um, if I'm wrong on that, I apologize. And uh, I would appreciate the board's and and town council's input. So there is an ours. I'm just going to quickly share the. So in our bylaws, we have a variance a departure from the terms of the bylaw yes. that the board may authorize under this bylaw. Um, and then for the use definitions, um, accessory use, non-conforming use, principal use, substantially different use, um, but I don't see anything here that specifically indicates that a variance for use is allowed. That we have we have with us, we have town council um Michael Cunningham with us. Um Mr. Cunningham, are you aware of anything in our zoning bylaws that authorizes the issuance of a use variance? Thank you. Uh Michael Cunningham town council, Mr. Chair. Um no. Um, however, I do refer to, I think it's section 3.22 of the bylaw that talks about the, re the responsibilities of this of this board and how it may grant variances in situations under 40A section 10. So I think, what, and what the applicant has done here, Attorney Corey, I think your application sets forth some of the arguments um, why uh, you may be entitled to a variance under that statute. Um, so that that's the question for me is that not not just the, the definition section, but what can this board do in terms of consideration of grant of a variance under the applicable statute and whether it's satisfied the criteria um, 
and you've made those, some of those arguments have been set forth in your application. Right. Uh, Mr. Chair, alternatively, uh, while this unit has been um, left vacant um, mm -hmm. for uh, more than two years, that's resulting in the lapse of the grandfathered status, there are three other units at the same property uh, that have been under continuous uh, use as uh, commercial retail um, uh, grandfathered um, use. Um, so you know, we would alternatively argue that the uh, grandfathered status hasn't lapsed um, uh, just because one of the four units within the building, the building um, exists and can only function as a commercial building, no residential unit in compliance with the R6 um, district rules can apply. Um, and we would submit that the board Alternatively, if you're if if the if the town's position is that a use variance is not permitted, that the um uh, that the use of the property uh, as a pre-existing non-conforming commercial use has not lapsed due to the fact that three of the four units are, un, are remain under continuous use uh, as a uh, commercial building, and there's no other there's no way that we that that fourth unit could ever be used. Uh, uh, for residential, given the fact for privacy and safety reasons, it's on the ground floor of a one-story building. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So <clears throat> I wanted to let's go back to the, on the use variance question, because I think that is something that needs to be resolved before we move on to the other, and figure out what to do with the argument that has just been made. Uh, section 10 of Mass General Law, Section 40, states in part that except where local ordinances or bylaws shall expressly permit variances for use, no variance may authorize a use or activity not otherwise permitted in the district in which the land or structure is located. So what that says to me is that Section 10 tells us that unless the town meeting has put an express provision in our bylaws that says we can grant use variances, state law is telling us that we cannot. And I guess I sort of agree that I don't see anything that qualifies as expressly telling us that use variances are allowed in Arlington. And in the absence of that, I believe it's under state law, they are not allowed in Arlington. Uh, so we have no if I am correct about that, and I believe I am, uh, then I don't think that we have any ability to grant a use variance at all. Um, then that brings us to the question of, I mean, it has been an interesting question in my mind, at least, how it is that we were dealing with all of this on a single unit basis in a multiple unit building and what the implications of what we're doing here would would do. Uh, would be uh, with respect to the other units and to the landlord generally. It seemed like an odd procedure to me, and I think that the applicant is kind of raising that as a uh, as as a difficulty. Suppose I don't really know, and I don't think that anything in the papers that we've been seeing uh, presents to us the issue whether or not a non-conforming use. Uh, has has not lapsed because it's only one unit in a building that is a commercial building. Um, and that may or may not be the case. But what I wonder is if it if if it is the case, how does it come to us? It's not a special permit. I don't think it would be a variance. If there were a decision uh, adverse to the applicant by the building inspector, conceivably it could come to us as an appeal from that decision. But I don't really see how ruling on the nonconformity is properly before us. Uh, and I mean, I this has been a project that's been much delayed, uh, but I'm not quite sure where our authority to try to, to resolve this is. And of course, we're just hearing about this question now and the papers up to now has been conceded that the that the uh, grandfather status has has lapsed. Uh, so we're kind of starting over without much basis in the record before us for evaluating it. 
No, I do wonder if we could get some advice from Mr. Cunningham as to the proper way to deal with the second with the second argument. Mr. Chair. Mr. Cunningham. Um, yeah, I think uh, Mr. Hamlin has laid it out quite correctly um, that the issue of prior nonconforming use under 48 section six uh, would not be before this board. Um, that is something that I, I was looking at, and I, but I did notice like Mr. Hanlon did that that issue was conceded as the, uh, the grandfather issue had, had lapsed in the paperwork that was filed by the applicant. However, if that's an arg if that's a position that the applicant would like to take at this time, I don't think that that would be properly before this board, but it would be something that the town itself through inspectional services and through this office, the legal department, um, could consider that position. If the, if we could work with the applicant on that, I would um, I would recommend that we do we we'd work on that with Attorney Corey um, through different channels, and it wouldn't be before this board. Mr. Chairman, thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Uh, Mr. Dupont, so I you know this may not be on point, but in the non-conforming uses and structures. Uh, provision in 81.1.1a, you know, the last sentence says it's the purpose of the bylaw to discourage the perpetuity of nonconforming uses whenever, whenever possible. And I think that that's a maxim in most zoning bylaws sort of just across the board. And I'm not entirely sure what Dr. Corey was getting at, but it sounded like there was some um, some sense that because this is only one of four units that you don't lose grandfathering as a result of the unit being vacant for a period of time. And that sort of, to me, stretches things a bit because then it suggests that if all you had three units um, that were vacant and the use had been abandoned and yet one of them still maintained that you'd be able to preserve the uh, you know, the status as being grandfathered for sort of in perpetuity. So I don't look at it that way. I think Mr. Hanlon had it right. I don't think there's anything in the variant statute that allows us absent a specific uh, reference or statement to the fact that we allow use variances to do anything with this. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Um, Mr. Chair, if we were um, if we were to go you know, pursue the second argument that I've presented, mm -hmm. um, would would the board suggest that I that we not go seek the board's relief? How would the process of appealing a decision of the building department um, and working with uh, Mr. Cunningham uh, work if they were not a formal? application to this board so i think there would be a couple of different um mr cunningham oh i will i will yield to you sorry mr chair um just in answer to that question there would be a formal legal opinion from the legal department regarding whether the grandfathering has lapsed under section uh, six to 48 um and we could we would have discussions with with you as the representative of the applicant um and then you potentially whatever that that decision might be um you would have recourse if that were if the if it was deemed that the the grandfather the grandfather right had had lapsed um and and that was the opinion of the legal department you would have recourse to appeal that but not through this board okay understood so I, i'm sorry mr chair i don't i don't want to nope. direct uh, any discussion except to, to you uh what i would do what we would do is present our argument in a letter to the board and to Mr. Cunningham? Um, I believe it would be directly to Mr. Cunningham, um, and not necessarily to the board because the- oh, I'm, Yes, I'm sorry. The, the board lacks the jurisdiction to act on this. Yes, yeah, so, uh, great. I meant to say the building department rather than the board. Ah, then yes. yes. Yeah. The, the chair is correct. Thank you. You're welcome. So with that, um oops mr mr hanlon nope i'm sorry i i i just was mumbling no um 
I, what the board has before it is a is a request for a type of relief that the board is not authorized to grant. Um, and I think the board will need to write a decision to that effect um, to be voted on at the at the next hearing um, where the board is doesn't have the authority to act, Mr. Cunningham, do we need to take public testimony? No, you do not, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Then with that, um, unless there's any additional questions from the board, um, I would take a motion to close Mr. Chairman, the... Mr. Hanlon? I, I've got it. I, I, I would like to be clearer as to what's going on here. Uh, you know, I've said as strongly as I can what my view of the statute is in terms of whether use, use variances are allowed. Um, if the applicant, in light of all that, wishes to withdraw, then he should just indicate that and we could accept the withdrawal. Uh, if he wants to pursue that, we should probably have a hearing on it because we're not in a position to say to to just construe the law without having the rest of the hearing. Uh, and so I just, you know, I'm, I, I, I think it's a little bit quick for us just to to, to dismiss it on, on this basis. Again, I'd like to turn to Mr. Mr. Cunningham, but, but I, I do wish, given, you know, that there's a certain degree of instability in the positions the applicant is taking, that if we're, if we're going to, if we're going to resolve the, consensually resolve the issue on on uh, use variances and that that's not in play anymore, I'd like the record to clearly show that. So, Mr. Hanlon, are you asking for an, a sense from Mr. Cunningham well, as to whether you'd be requesting uh, a withdrawal or? Yes, it, it may be. It, I'm just suggesting that maybe the most efficient way to do this, if the applicant doesn't want to go through a hearing where we have to go through the whole business because we we can't really say what the result of the variance application is until we've had a hearing. Um, uh, we he could withdraw the application before us and prefer to go through, and we could do that without prejudice in case he wants to the, he wants to try again, uh, or we should go forward with something. But we shouldn't leave. We we shouldn't be in a position where we're denying something without a hearing. Mr. Corey has been trying to get a word in, and I yeah. suggest that maybe we allow <laughs> Mr. Corey. Um, uh, thank you, and, and thank you, Mr. Handler. That was, you read my mind. Um, I, I wouldn't want to go, we we prepared this application on a misunderstanding, apparently, uh, of the byline, um, and we, we wouldn't want to get to a decision where we're denied and then locked out for two years, or worse yet, the landlord's locked out for two years, because I would think that would be something that said that he couldn't put anybody in there except a residential uh, tenant. What I'd like to do is, uh, if the board would allow, is withdraw without prejudice so that we're not uh, uh, locked out for, for two years uh, to come before this board. Uh, we'd, we'd like the chance to review the, um, the law and uh, go back uh, to Mr. Cunningham um, with his request, with a, with uh, uh, with a uh, request responsive to his instruction, or if we find something um, that we think is a basis for uh, a use variance uh, by this board, um, renew the application. Um, that said, I defer to this board as to whether you you have uh, you've issued use variances in the past. If you haven't, it's probably a good reason. I, I am unaware of any use variances granted by this board in the last, Roger, how long have we been on? Like 10 years? 12, 12 years. 12 years? You, you'd know better than I. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Cunningham? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think that if the, if the chair and the board is inclined to accept the the applicant's withdrawal um, without prejudice. I think that makes, uh, that's a prudent way forward. Um, and I would be happy to work with the applicant and council to try and figure out um, what options exist. Great, thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Um, 
unless there's further questions from the board, I think um, the chair would accept a motion to accept the withdrawal of the uh, variance application for uh, docket 3805, 232 Massachusetts Avenue. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Without. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is that a second for Mr. DuPont? Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say it's without prejudice, as Mr. Clark. Without prejudice. Thank you. Uh, and with that, uh, second. Okay. So there's a motion before the board is to withdraw the, without prejudice, the uh, request for variance under docket 3805-232 Massachusetts Avenue. So vote of the board. Um, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That motion is accepted. Um, and that application was uh, withdrawn. But thank you all very much. Thank um, you very much. You're welcome. With that, returning to our agenda for the evening, I'll uh, continue with item number five on our agenda, which is docket 3802, 296 Washington Street. Uh, it's a continuance of a prior hearing. Uh, there was a noticed meeting of the board last week on site uh, to review um, the, the conditions and to, to get a better sense as to what uh, what the application is requesting and why specifically they're requesting it on, as a variance. Um, so I uh, return to the to the applicants, thank them for their um, uh, for coming back before the board. Um, I understand there was uh, a late resubmittal of the site plan. Um, so that was not posted to the agenda. I am going to go ahead and share that now. Um, and if you could explain what we are looking at. And that, uh, yeah, so this is the, the site, the property plot and site plan with the trees now included. Um, okay. And so the, and we thank the board for, we know this is a late submission due to the holidays, the surveyors were able to get out there and put the all the trees on the property um, on the map, which I think the board had asked for. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, that's what we're looking at here is the, the, the um, measurements of each of the trees. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit to that in just a minute. And then do you know what the um, so I'm going to go ahead and just sort of try to focus in a little bit tighter here. Um, and so in blue, that is showing the slope of the land. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Slope of the land, the trees, which I believe the board had asked for both of those. Yes. Indications, right. Um, Did you yeah. receive the second page that had all the. Yeah, there uh, you go. Yes. Yep. Good. Thank you. So this shows all the spot grades. Yeah. Yep. Going around the property. Okay. Yeah. And so we can we can return to this. Do, uh, do, do you mind if I go through some of our um, comments regarding the application? No. Nope. Okay. Great. Um, so we want to start off by thanking the board for coming out to visit the property and carefully considering the application for their var requested variance. We now have a much better sense of the requirements related to special conditions of the property and are going to focus our discussion tonight on that issue. But for the sake of the record, very quickly, I just want to um, review the arguments that we made last week related to the first two criteria of the requested variance. Um, and then I'll, I'll focus my time talking about the special conditions. So. Um, so first, um, as we noted before, a failure to grant the variance and special permit would create a substantial hardship um, without the proposed uh, addition. Uh, addition. Um, we'd be unable to add space to our house to improve its use and function. And specifically, the proposed addition would allow us to address limitations in our existing layout, which includes expanding a very small kitchen with limited counter space. Um, and in addition, which would allow us to expand our dining area, which currently does not support more than four people um, around a dining table. Um, the proposed addition would improve the capacity of our house to host family, neighborhood, and community functions, including supporting events for local teams, theater groups, and our house. Um, 
uh, the, the building of a second story is prohibitive because it would limit our ability to age in place in this house. It would greatly disrupt our family, um, particularly our child who is entering eighth grade in terms of her stability because we'd need to move out of our home and it would dramatically and prohibitively increase the costs of this project. So secondly, granting the variance would improve rather than be a detriment to the public good. Uh, we believe the, the proposed addition improves the public good by increasing property values, increasing the aesthetic of the neighborhood through an enhanced curb appeal. It's universally supported by the neighbors. There's no detriment to the neighborhood because there are many other corner lots and other types of lots in the, in the general area that are within the setback. Um, and there's no impact to the safety um, because the home is on a dead end street and visibility would not be inhibited by the proposed building as I think the, the group was able to see when they came out. So focusing then today on what I think was the issue that was remaining um, is the third criteria. And we believe that the proposed building would not undermine the intent and purpose of the zoning law because our, our lot has a unique topography and to some extent shape where a little enfor literal enforcement of the ordinance would create a hardship. Um, and I have a few points here. First, um, as the board saw, there's a very steep embankment on the north northwest side of the property. Um, no other corner lot on Washington Street that we've been able to see has this type of steep embankment in the back of the house. Um, the embankment joins the property at 300 Washington Street, which is approximately five feet higher in elevation. The embankment would restrict the expansion of the house towards the north northwest side. Um, in addition to the embankment, there is a very large oak tree on the north northwest side of the property. It's indicated on the map that you've just seen, the plot you've just seen, um, with the two trees that are 30 inches. They're, in fact, two separate trees that have grown together at the bottom. So um, at what we could see at sort of a uh, you know, breast height, that that's about 60 inches um, in diameters, 230 inches, uh, if nothing else. It has an incredibly expansive root system. Um, we would be prohibited from building towards the north, northwest, or directly west of the backside of the house to any degree under the principles of the critical root zone. Um, and it would be impossible to build on the backside of the house without a substantial hardship to the town of Arlington, the adjoining lots or our property. Um, and the reason is that removing that tree would not only cause harm to Arlington's tree canopy, but would negatively impact the topography of the soil conditions, both on our lot and on the lot at 300 Washington Street, which is above the embankment. Because that tree and its extensive root system is actually holding up that whole embankment. Um, so any attempt to take that tree out in order to build in that direction would significantly undermine uh, the soil in that area on that embankment. Um, and I think would negatively impact not only our lot, but negatively impact our neighbor's lot um, as well. Um, and finally, our corner lot is uh, only similar to a few other corner lots in the, in the neighborhood because of the angle of Washington Street and Gay Street. Um, obviously it's not comparable to any single street facing lots. Um, but of the corner lots, most are built in such a way that the structures already exceed the setback in our neighborhood. Um, but because our house is slightly askew on the lot in such a way, uh, we're quickly entering that setback, making it very difficult to, to build in, in pretty much any other direction besides the direction that we're asking for in the proposed variance. Um, so again, we really appreciate the, the board providing more clarity to us on these conditions. Um, Fernando is also here to uh, answer questions about the proposed um, build as well, um, and we are happy to to entertain questions or comments from the board. Great. Thank you very much. I'll go ahead and stop the share. Um, so what the board has before it, this is a uh, it's a variance application. We had discussed this initially um, at our prior hearing. Um, the The main, the reason that this is a variance and not a special permit is, um, as the applicant has said, due to um, due to conditions which they have identified, uh, expanding the house in the direction of um, the rear lot line or the side lot line. Um, has certain impracticalities to it and will 
can impose a, a hardship on the owners. And so therefore they have proposed uh, moving in, into the front existing front yard along Gay Street, which um, is, not, uh, is not the primary street, Washington Street is the primary street, Gay is a dead end street. Um, but they, they feel that uh, making this motion uh, will um, allow them to uh, to continue to occupy their house and it is in the position that will cause the least detriment to um, to both themselves and to their neighbors. Um, so I did want to invite members of the board. Um, you had had an opportunity to visit the site um, last week. <clears throat> Based on what the the applicant has presented, do you have any questions or comments? Um, in regards to the application. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Um, so thinking about the um, argument that's being made in terms of the tree and the embankment and after you know being out on the site and, and walking around the property for a little while and um, also kind of walking around the neighborhood for a little while to understand the neighborhood context a little bit better. I think that um, it's it's kind of a unique condition in the area of this embankment with such a large tree that um, I do agree is holding up to that embankment as as we know you know we want to keep plantings um, on embankments like that to keep that from them uh, eroding. So I can see why uh, you know going this way with the addition is to help save that tree due to the. the unique location of it um, and its purpose that it's serving other than just being a shade tree uh, on this property. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. Could we go back to the uh, site plan, the plot plan? Absolutely. So, um, so if we are calling, um, if we're calling where the embankment of the tree is, the rear yard for the moment, um, since it's under a hundred feet, the rear yard setback would be uh, twenty percent of the of the lot depth. Is that accurate? That is correct. So we'd be talking, I guess we'd be looking, I'm not sure with the curve on the street, on Gay Street, what that dimension is. But if you look at the upper dimension where it's 92 feet, we're looking at what, 18 feet? roughly. 17.1, uh, according to their calculation. All right. So if you were to go away from the house 17.1 feet, that really brings you to that embankment, does it not? Um, are you talking in the back of the house? Yes. So um, you could you could extend to the required setback the 20% of the the 92 feet um by right. However, that would still be within close proximity to the tree. Yeah, right. and the, the and the embankment. Yeah, and the embankment. And and the the calculations on the critical root zone of that tree would extend basically into the area, which is our backyard, which is looks like our 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 backyard and our side yard. There, I mean that that critical root zone goes very far out. Um, I think if you even went with the eleven feet and th the structure that would take up all that space and being so close to the embankment, the problem here is going to be the water runoff, having nowhere to go. It will undermine that tree. That tree will eventually just end up falling because we are taking a lot of that root structure away. It is a big tree. It's a beautiful tree. It'd be a shame to get rid of it. But as a builder, the water runoff, where where that water is going to go, because we are proposing a basement, a lower section on the uh, proposed addition for the storage and the entrance from the driveway now, we would need that additional storage. So that taking away more soil is going to create even more of a bigger water problem. And as a builder, I just couldn't couldn't even 
want to put it there because of my concerns of many years that mm -hmm. these folks would have with water coming down Washington Street from 300 over to 296. Thank you. Uh, Mr. DuPont? So I think that, you know, maybe sometimes we have to stretch our minds a little bit because, I mean, we're we're certainly familiar with topography claims where you have a very street, uh, I'm sorry, a very um, large slope, very steep slope. And then also with what we call soil conditions. So if somebody had a, a big chunk of, uh, you know, granite or some slab of underlying rock that was not common in the area, I think we'd be looking at it and the at least I'd be looking at it from the view that, oh, those are conditions which seem to meet a variance criteria. Um, at the same time, though, I think that, you know, the combination of these sort of hydrological concerns and, you know, the slope and the, the root system at least present something for consideration as far as whether those things can be under the umbrella of topography and or soil condition. So I'm just saying, I think I'm open to the idea that that is the case and uh, would like to hear from other members of the board, the public or the applicants too. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, I'm, a, I'm in agreement really with, <laughs> with Mr. DuPont. I just wanted to point out, I mean, part of what is going on here is you can't look at soil and shape and so forth in isolation and just say, well, if you look at a map, you see there are lots of lots that are shaped like this. And there's certainly a lot of hills in this part of Arlington. Uh, it's, it's the way all these things interact in a particular circumstance. And even though it's trite to say that every property is different, and that's not necessarily true for the purpose of, of variance law, uh, you still need to look at the way everything fits together and see whether that creates a position of hardship that it's part of the job of a variance to relieve people from. Uh, and I'm inclined to think that that if you look at it from that point of view, um, that it is. Uh, as Ms. Farrell has pointed out, both the preservation of the environment and the trees and the interests of the neighbors, the interests that are protected by the zoning law, er everything that we think that we're here to try to uphold is really defeated if we take a the, a kind of, of abstract view of the zoning bylaw that that causes this to to not be subject to consideration. And to some extent, the legislators back in the 1970s who gave us this condition probably intended that sometimes good cases would go bad. But it seems to me here that enough of a case is made out uh, that I that that it, it's painful actually just from the point of view of the zoning bylaw and and town's policy it's painful to be forced into the position where you have to say no to something that in other every other respect is so clearly right and i so i think that that we're in the right ballpark here we've had recently a case where we also took a a narrow view, uh, a, a highly sp plot specific view of the way in which shape and topography interacted, uh, and in that case, we granted the variance, uh, the variance as well. So, I think that it's quite right that we need to look at not just whether something is hilly and whether something has got a soil problem or a shape issue, but the way that works on a particular site and. And that may be very different with respect to this site than others that also have slopes and also have shape issues, but they don't fit together in a way that causes hardship in the way this does. Well, thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Other comments from the board? Mr. Chair. Mr. Riccadelli. I agree with Mr. Hanlon. Um, I, you know, I think, I think like he said, you know, it's uh, all these items taken together I think presents a, a good case, and I want you know I want to thank the applicant for presenting a very clear and um, understandable way to view the site. 
you know, it's it's a small lot. Um, there are not very many opportunities for expansion. There are constraints really on every side of this of this property, and building up would be cost prohibitive. So, I, I think um, I think I'm I'm convinced or leading to be convinced that the, uh, that when taken together, all of those things uh, do pass the bar uh, that we've been talking about of the variance. Thank you, Mr. Fidelli. Anything else on the board before I change over to public comment? It's seeing none. I'm um, going to be opening the this hearing for public comment in a second. Just to reiterate, um, so we take public comment. Um, it's taken as it relates to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose, purpose of informing its decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the reactions tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the chair, asked to give your name and address for the record and given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair and please remember to speak clearly. For anyone wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing, the chair will allow those wishing to speak for the first time to be called upon first. And once all public questions and comments have been addressed, uh, public comment period will be closed. So with that, are there any members of the public who wish to address this hearing? Uh, hand up, uh, Steve Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. I uh, unfortunately was not able to join the board for the, the first phase of, of this case. Um, and I was going to try and join your site visit, but I was out of town and I couldn't do that. Um, that all being said, I want to, um, I want to uh, applaud both the applicant for uh, their concern relative to um, uh, the topography and the trees and such that, as you all well know, that's always my general interest. And this is a magnificent tree that would be preserved and helpful to the area for a couple of reasons. Um, I, I, I want to basically applaud the, um, um, the concerns and thought out applicant points on, uh, on all those things. That's not always the case with many of these sorts of projects. Um, trees are becoming an increasing uh, important resource to the town and concern of, of town residents. And the, the, the concern on the part of the applicants is clear and, uh, and I absolutely uh, agree with their points. I also want to, um, to recognize the dynamic thinking of the board that we've heard tonight relative to the fact that there's the letter of the law, the spirit of the law, and then sort of the what may be prerogative of the board to make a unique decision or, or a singular decision in the case of a singular set of conditions on this property. And um, it sounds like that sort of integrated kind of thinking is uh, is supporting the approach here, which is being advanced by the applicant and, and, uh, and sounds uh, through the comments of the various board members that uh, it's being viewed positively. So I just want to thank all the participants here for um, uh, the support to the tree canopy, the maintenance of trees like this, which are uh, unfortunately disappearing resource in town, uh, and uh, and the concern um, for that uh, relative to this project. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, next to the hand raised is uh, Ryan Cronin. Yes, this is Ryan Cronin, and I have Lisa Cronin as well, the landlord for 232 Mass Ave. And I just wanted to add that we would like to thank the board and to thank Mr. Cunningham in particular for his upcoming partnership. And we ask that he diligently um, and quickly partner with Mr. Corey to resolve this issue. We have suffered severe hardship due to COVID and the loss of this tenant. This property has been commercial for 50 plus years and the town currently charges us as commercial so, taxes yep. and so Mr. Cronin, mm -hmm. um, this is that matter has already been closed uh, for this evening. Um, so this is the matter of Washington Street. So if you have comment related to Washington mm -hmm. Street, we can accept it. Otherwise, 
um, the matter regarding Massachusetts Avenue is already closed for this evening. Apologies, is there a general forum at the end for speaking or no? Um, not really. Um, you're certainly welcome to, to stay to the end and we will absolutely accept your comment um, okay. at that time. If you, or if you just wish to, um, you can always submit it uh, via email to uh, the board's website. Okay, yeah, I mean, I can wait till the end. I only have two more sentences to say. If you only have a couple more sentences, why don't you just go ahead and okay. it, we'll leave it at that. Thank you, and apologies for voicing this at the wrong opinion. And this isn't directed at this board in particular, but we are disappointed with the town of Arlington and how this issue has been handled. Multiple people in offices have directed us to this board, and we continue to suffer um, financial harm from the way that this is being handled by the town. Not so, so yeah, thank you. Thank okay. you for listening to us. And we look forward to continuing to working with the town of Arlington <gasps> to resolve this issue quickly. Thank you. Appreciate that. Are there any other members of the public who wish to address the, the matter at um, on Washington Street? Once going twice. Seeing no other hands raised, I will go ahead and close the public comment period for this hearing. Um, so again, what the board has before it, this is a variance request mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> where the applicant is requesting to uh, add a one-story addition uh, to the front yard of the property facing Gay Street. And they have are proposing an open porch on the within the front yard uh, on the side facing Washington Street. Um, they are not proposing an addition that would uh, be on top of the house. They're intending to essentially maintain the existing building height. Um, and as has been stated, the, there are several reasons for why they have uh, requested that they, um, why, they, why they believe that a variance would be appropriate. Um, in this case. Uh, so the, the laws for the granting of a variance uh, are stated under state law chapter 40A section 10. Uh, there are four tests that a board must apply in order to determine whether um, a, a variance may be granted. And um, unless there are further questions or comments from the board, I would go ahead um, and have us discuss those findings um, in order. And we, at the end of the discussion of each, we'll just take a quick straw vote to confirm that the board feels that that finding can be made. Um, and then we'll move on to the last. Um, should the board find that the, a case can be made for all four findings, then we will discuss uh, whether there are conditions of this um, or which the board would want for approval. And then we would vote uh, to close the the hearing on this case. So, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, um, I'm. I have to confess to being a little confused because we've been focusing so much on the variance, but isn't there also an issue here about getting a special permit for a large addition? That is absolutely correct. Um, now, obviously, to some extent, the considerations overlap, so we don't have to go through everything twice, but we do have to remember to grant the permit if that's where we're going. Yep. No, I appreciate that. Um, and I did just want to confirm um, the proposed uh, porch on the in the front yard, whether that can be approved under 539. Um, in the request that bag, this is a porch more than 25 square feet in area, more than once, one more than one pail. Which, so we would, the board would need to also include a special permit under 539A for that porch facing Washington Street. And 542B6 is the large addition. 
Thank you, Mr. Hanlon, for reminding me of that. Are there any other questions from the board in regards to this application? Seeing none, we'll go ahead then and move uh, forward to um, the required findings on the variance. Uh, so the first is uh, why circumstances related to soil condition, shape, topography, especially affecting such land or structures, but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it is located, that would substantiate the granting of a variance. Um, as we've been discussing uh, so far this evening, the primary issue with this site uh, has to do with the uh, what's the backyard, which, which is effectively the side yard on Washington Street, having a large grade change between this property and the abutting property, and that grade change being dominated by a line of large, very mature trees. Um, the, the pair of 30-inch oak trees that were mentioned, there's also an additional 36-inch oak tree closer to Washington Street. Um, the critical root zones of all of those extend beyond the existing foundation wall of the house. Uh, so there really is nowhere to construct on that so portion of the property that um, is outside of that critical root zone. And as has been expressed by the applicant and um, uh, somewhat confirmed by Mr. Moore, the really the soils in that whole area are dominated by the by the tree roots. And so this is a specific condition unrelated to other things other things on this site that are tied in not only with the, the, the soils, but also the topography of this site um, that really preclude the, the expansion of the house into this area without uh, substantial detriment to uh, not only to the applicants, but also to their immediately abutting neighbors and also uh, the general public in this area. Um, are there any, uh, any um, other comments in regards to um, that first criteria? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hamlin. Just to have said it aloud for the record, but this is, I mean, that is both, I think, something that relates to topography and, and soils, but it's also a particular condition that is not widespread in the area, so that it, in my mind, at least meets the criteria that it uh, uh, it not be in common with other pro properties in the zoning district. Thank you. With that, I will ask, um, we'll do just a quick straw vote of the board as to whether they feel that uh, the, this first finding can be made. Uh, so because we're online, all votes have to be taken by roll call. So with that, Mr. Hanlon. Yes. Mr. DuPont. Yes. Mr. Cadelli. Yes. Mr. LeBlanc. Yes. The chair votes yes. Moves us to finding number two, why a literal enforcement of the provisions of the zoning bylaw specifically relating to the circumstances affecting the land or structure noted above would involve substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the petitioner or appellant. Um, so this is the sort of the hardship that is linked to uh, the first portion. Um, and, and as we had said, the, the real hardship has to do with the um, if they were to construct the addition in the in this rear yard, uh, they would suffer the loss of the trees, um, which would be a detriment to both themselves or their abutting neighbors. And these are not small trees. These are an 80 to 100 year investment in, in tree growth that cannot easily be replaced. Um, and also as was expressed by the applicants, um, Expanding the house vertically would cause them to need to relocate um, for a period of time and would also be a, a substantially more expensive um, renovation, which is which would cause them both a hard a, a hardship of of expense, but also uh, would be an interruption to uh, the the education opportunities for their child who's uh, who's at home. And so um, that is the the case that is made 
for why the literal enforcement of the provisions um, would involve a substantial hardship. Are there any other comments in regards to this finding? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I think that it's also useful to <clears throat> remember that that the, the what um, Ms. Farrell said that it the house is quite small and it has the, the what the applicant is attempting to do is not to build a McMansion but basically to build a dining room that has more than four seats in it and a kitchen that has some counter space. It's the sort of thing all of the rest of us take for granted, but if you have a house of a certain age and a certain design, uh, it's not there to take for granted. And I think that if we, the applicants were unable to address that problem or unable to do it without unreasonable expense, uh, that that in itself would be a substantial hardship. And I would count that too. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Anything further from the board? Seeing none, we'll take the straw vote on this second finding <clears throat> on the literal enforcement of the provisions. Uh, so with that, Mr. Hanlon? Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Yes. Mr. Cadelli? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. And the chair votes yes. That brings us to number three. How desirable relief may be granted without substantial detriment to the public good. Um, <clears throat> so the design that was proposed to the board and um, I will see if I can quickly bring this back up for uh, for viewing. So this is the existing house and this is the proposed. Um, <clears throat> what's being proposed is, is fairly modest um, where this is the existing footprint of the house and this is the proposed footprint. Um, it is, uh, the, the expansion of the house is not uh, creating a substantial detriment it's expanding the use of an existing single family house in a single family district in a way that allows the property owners um to better utilize uh their existing house and to make sure that it is something that uh they're able to uh, enjoy in the long term and as they had said that um by maintaining it on a single level it does allow them to um uh, to age in place in this in this house um and those would all be uh be considered public goods are there other comments in regards to this third finding mr chairman mr hanlon i'm i'm hoping that that this may actually shorten our consideration of the case but to considerable extent the third criteria is coterminous when, with what we say under special permits, but whether it's consistent with with the character of the neighborhood. And we should be looking at the ways in which this proposal um, uh, preserves that. And I think that here, the proposal that they have is excellently designed to do that. We've we've already seen why there's a public benefit in their putting the addition here rather than trying to put an addition elsewhere. Um, the, on the other side of Gay Street is a house that is considerably removed from this one and would not be crowded by the addition at all. Uh, the addition is also put in a place that had, does not have any adverse effect on the, narrow, the neighbor that is immediately I'm, I'm going to, I don't have my north and west, but that is immediately behind this count house, house on Gay Street. Um, so all considered, it's an, it's a very sensitive design to the interests of the community as a whole. 
Uh, and this, what I've just said, I could easily have said when we get to the special permit, when we get to the provision about um, consistency with the character of the neighborhood, and I could easily have said it just the same about whether it's harmonious with the neighborhood, taking into consideration the interest of the abutters. And so having said it that once, I won't send it, say it again there, uh, but I think that that here, what we say affects what we think about it uh, under those other two headings, which is a very similar issue. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. With that, we'll do the quick straw vote on the third uh, required finding for a variance. Mr. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. DuPont? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Riccadelli? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. The chair votes yes. It brings us to number four of the required findings, how desirable relief may be granted without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of the zoning bylaw. Um, the desired relief is essentially to have an expanded single family home. This is something that happens um, throughout Arlington. Um, it is the intent of the zoning bylaw to uh, preserve the value of land, to preserve open space, to um, allow for the provision of ventilation and sunlight to and to have an orderly expansion of the tax base. Um, all of these that are expressed in the zoning bylaw um, would apply to uh, this particular application. So are there any other comments in regards to the question of how desirable relief may be granted? Seeing none, we'll move on to a the straw vote on the fourth finding, uh, Mr. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. DuPont? Yes. Mr. Riccadelli? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. Chair votes yes. So the board has found that the required findings can be made to substantiate the granting of a variance. Um, and as Mr. Hanlon had noted, um, this project does also require the issuance of a special permit for a large addition under Section 542B6 in the zoning bylaw. Um, this has three specific findings that need to be made. The first is that the alteration or addition is in harmony with other structures and uses in the vicinity. And as Mr. Hanlon has noted, we have already addressed this uh, through the uh, review of the findings required for the, for the variance. The second is consider the dimensions and setbacks in relation to abutting structures and uses. Uh, Mr. Hanlon made this case in regards to the discussion of the third point. And the last is to consider conformity with the purposes of the bylaw, and that was discussed by us in the granting of the fourth finding. Um, and then the last thing that we also need to do is we need to, uh, we would need to authorize a special permit under uh, 539A bec uh, because there is a proposed porch on the Washington Street side, which is four feet deep, and any porch that is in excess of 3.5 feet needs to be. Uh, granted a special permit by the board. Um, and I, I I don't believe that there is any concern from the board uh, that the additional six inches being requested for the porch on this side of the house uh, would cause any detriment to the neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> so what the board has in front of it, then we are authorized to grant the variance um, we have reviewed the find the required findings for the large addition and for the porch. Uh, the question then become moves on to a question of conditions. Um, so the board has three standard conditions that would be applied both to variances and to special permits. Uh, the first is that the plans and specifications approved by the board for this variance and, and special permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. There should be no deviation during construction from the approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the zoning Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. The second is that the building inspector is hereby notified they are to monitor the site and should proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures that any time they determine violations are present. The building inspector shall proceed under Section 3.1 of the Zoning Bylaw and under the provisions of Chapter 40, Section 21D of the Massachusetts General Laws and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with Section 3.1. And the third is that the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to this variance grant, um, <clears throat> where uh, 
I think a large portion of the, there were sort of two factors um, in regards to the, the granting of the variants that uh, dealt with the, um, uh, the expansion of the house and why it was important that the house be expanded in the direction that it was. Um, I would ask Mr. Hanlon if he thinks that condition number three provides sufficient um, protection from a future uh, owner trying to uh, do a vertical addition or to expansion in the direction of the trees or whether that is something that the board should include in as a condition. Did you read the language that you're referring to again so I can focus on it? Because sure. I don't have it I don't have it sitting <clears throat> in front of me. No, no, no. So in the granting of the variance, um the 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 items that led to the hardship one was that the expansion of the house vertically would cause a a, a financial hardship and a, a personal hardship to the owners and the expansion of the house in the direction of the trees would cause um, a hardship to the homeowners and to the the neighborhood in general by the loss of the of the the tree canopy and the the large trees my question was should because those hardships were sort of baked into the decision should they be included as a condition um that no addition on top of the house or to the um or into the rear yard shall be done without um without a vote of the zoning board of appeals or whether you felt that our condition number three where we maintain continuing jurisdiction would already cover that i think that it's <clears throat> combined with section one. Uh, I section one is the final plans and specifications, mm -hmm. which will be for a one one story addition. Shall be the final plans and specifications, and there can't be any def, uh, deviation without the written approval of the Arlington Board. Mm -hmm. And number three essentially enforces that by uh, saying that we maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to the grant. So I would say that I mean, it seems to me clear that if a future somebody in the future wanted to add another story on there that that would be a deviation from approved plans and that they'd have to get some they'd have to come back to us okay. that being said <laughs> i don't know that anybody who doesn't who 20 years from now uh, doesn't listen to this tape will figure that out and if we want to put a condition on uh, that makes it clear that that if anyone wants to go up, they have to come back. Uh, that uh, that uh, uh, it would be better to take away the misunderstanding and not repose undue confidence in the uh, wisdom of our successors. So anyway, yeah, I think that we should have this condition. So then I would propose a condition that any further addition to the building requires approval by the board. Are there any other conditions that members of the board feel would be appropriate? What about requiring approval, requiring the preservation of the trees that we are working hard so hard to do the the applicants, I'm sure, in good faith and are not planning to clear cut their backyard. But you, you never, I mean, these things go on for a long time, and I think that the uh, you can't ever be sure what other people will do later on. If this is important enough to be able to grant the variance, it's important enough to put in the conditions of things, particularly if the applicants are willing to agree to that. I think that our, our only comment to that was that, you know, within, I don't know, reasonable expectations, it would seem because, you know, if the trees were to decline or something like that, I mean, we would want to have you know, some control over what happens to those for safety of the, the house and right. the houses. So around I, the yeah. Understood. And presumably the tree warden should be involved in dealing with situations of that kind. But yes, the idea is a reasonable condition, not an absolute one.
Okay, so I have the applicants and contractors shall make all necessary actions to preserve the trees during the course of the construction. Perfect. Hanlon, do you find that sufficient? No. Uh, okay. I'm kind of hoping that we do. I'm not. I'm. I'm more concerned about people later ah, okay. uh, taking the trees down because they have a different aspiration for the house. And it's a public interest and not just the private interest involved that is leading us to this decision. And we ought to preserve that. Do you have any, propo any proposed language? No, I've been blathering on so much. I haven't had a chance to write anything down. <laughs> um, how about then further? All practical. Uh, so how about the applicants and contractors shall make all necessary actions to preserve the trees during the course of the construction thereafter all practical actions shall be taken to preserve the trees along the rear lot Yeah, I think that works yeah, as long as practical works. action, right? You know, assuming yeah. the tree doesn't get hit by lightning and we have to take it down or something like right. that. Right. Yeah, I I would just include a sentence of there saying that, saying in substance that, if in the event that a practical consider, in, in, without trying to get illegal about it, if in deciding whether or not a practical contingency has come up that has leads it to come down, I would like to see a consultation with the tree warden so that it's not it's it's not just the judgment of the of the homeowner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not done out of our preference. I mean, yeah. And I don't foresee that this will come up um, because we will be here and we will be maintaining those trees. Um, but um, we just we don't want to be locked into something that makes it. Yep. Yeah challenging we'll, we will clean that up in the writing of the decision any other considerations for conditions seeing none um so the board has on the variance application, the board has found that it meets the requirements to be able to issue the variance. Um, on the special permit side, the board has found that it can grant a special permit for a large addition and for the uh, porch in the front yard setback. Um, and the board has identified the three standard conditions and two additional conditions which they would apply to this grant. Um, are there any other actions from the board in regards to this application? Being none, uh, the board will then, uh, I would accept a motion um, to close the public hearing for docket number 3802, 296 Washington Street. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. And Mr. Hanlon, if I could ask that you uh, prepare a decision um, based on the discussions we've had this evening. I will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to the board for your consideration and assistance to us throughout this process. Very welcome. I, we just need to do the final vote of the board. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Uh, aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. Mr. LeBlanc? Aye. 
in the chair votes I we are closed on 296 Washington Street. Thank you so much to the applicants. I appreciate their uh their time and efforts uh in coming before the board. Thank you, board. Appreciate everything. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. So returning to our agenda this evening. Where are you? There you are. Uh this brings us to item seven, uh docket three eight zero six. Uh, which is 109 Wright Street. Um, if I could ask the applicants to um, introduce themselves and tell us what they are proposing to do. So my name is Joanna Rack. I'm the architect for um, this proposal and um, Eric and Jessica Legault are here who are the homeowners as well. And I just want to say that I'm in Japan, so it's <laughs> Wednesday morning here this time. So if I blip out or glitch or anything, I'm in the Japanese Alps. So oh. bear with me. <laughs> the uh, the I think the the side view in that window there sort of gives it away. Yeah. <laughs> so it's breakfast time here. Um, so I think we have we have two um, two applications in one for a special permit, one for a variance. Um, and I th I think the variance we don't need to do but let's go with the easy part first um so we want to do a rear addition um that is two stories or basically three stories basement first and second it's a walkout basement um and it's an existing non-conforming house um so our side setback um currently is um is seven foot six on the right hand side and it's nine foot six on the left-hand side at the shortest, and we're conforming to the left-hand setback um, at 10 foot four, and we are not increasing the non-conformity with our addition. We're actually um, bettering it at eight foot um, at the rear corner, and we have a double lot, so the owners own both lot A and B, um, so we have um, combined square footage, a lot of 10,275 square feet. Um, so we've got, we meet the rear setback by a lot. Um, and that's also a large house addition that we need to get approval for the, the special permit um, as it's a larger addition in the back. Thank you. And I believe the, so, um, yeah, so the in the the, the question the special permit is the uh under uh 542b6 which is the the large addition um mm -hmm. which you can see here on the, to the rear of the house um and then uh briefly to touch on the um the variance question yeah, so so here's I guess I don't do you have a um a picture of the front elevation drawing? I am switching to that in a second here. Okay. Let's see. So here's it's sort of a conundrum. Um so we are at 25 feet, you know, all the houses along Wright Street are right at, at the front setback and they have sort of larger backyards. Um what I'm hoping to do, what I'd like to do is it's a very flat house on the front so i'd like to get a front gable which could even be this is what it is now um there we are. so Oops, all i'm okay. trying to do is pad out a little bit so i could get a front gable to make the house look better like more curb appeal and have the house look uh better than it does so you know it doesn't have to be anything more than like six inches the second floor existing overhangs by about eight inches on the front and the back um so it's not going to have a foundation. It's not actually living space. I just want to have that front piece padded out. Um, and per um, the zoning bylaw 5.3.9, uh, 5 there's a bunch of different sort of exceptions and regulations, you know, like a first story um, projection can go you know, uh, can extend the, on the first floor three and a half feet in. The second story addition can extend no more than one foot beyond. So I think we can comply with all of those, but I think it needs a special permit um, to be able to. And I just was hoping for the board's help to sort of figure out how to define that because um, it would be under 25 square feet. 
but again, it wouldn't be living space. It would just be sort of, we'd be adding on, like padding out that wall to make a deeper wall so that I could get that return and have that front gable. Thank you. Um, so I know I had posed some questions and I, I saw that the responses had come in. Um, did you determine what the average grade elevation was both before and after the construction? So we're not raising the height of the house at all. So we're keeping that existing roof um, and matching everything to it. So it's it's staying the same. I have about, it's about 28 feet average grade. So the, um, the, what, the what the real question is, so mm -hmm. the lowest, is the lowest floor a story or not? I believe it is. So by the criteria. does it, does the house, is the house being converted from being a two story house to being a three story we house? Not, no, it's already, it's, it's really already is per the definition. It already is a three story house just because we have that walkout garage and the walkout basement. Um, so all we're doing is we're not increasing the nonconformity of that. It's just staying the same. So the grade at the front is higher and then it slopes mm -hmm. down in the back so that we have that walkout basement. But if you look okay. at the sides, there's quite a lot of the foundation wall that's above grade as well. So we're not we're not changing that at all. We're just sort of putting the addition on the back straight back and and we're not regrading or doing anything different with the lot. Okay. Okay. The exist the the application lists the existing height as two and a half stories, but you're saying that is it is actually three. Yeah, I when I was thinking about it, I was thinking about the stories above the first floor. So that was my just typo error. So um, we are well under the thirty five feet, even at the three stories in the rear. It's just it's a very short house. Yeah. Um, so it's just that we have three stories, but we're well under the thirty five foot height restriction. Okay. Um, and we're not increasing the height. We're not, the height is staying what it is. And we're just working with what's there. Okay. Um, and then the the rear, what is going to be the condition of the rear yard? Is it essentially a lawn? Is it wooded no, at all? So they have, a, a, you know, it's a beautiful back lawn. It mm -hmm. sort of slopes up towards Hancock Street. Um, but it's a pretty flat, you know, backyard you know, once it heads down from the front of the house to the backyard, it sort of is pretty flat until it starts to head up to Hancock Street. And it's all okay. lawn and landscaped and, you know, it's beautiful. So okay. we're not changing much of that or any of it really. All right. Um, yeah, because there was a question about the calculations for usable open space and landscaped open space. We have no concerns that you meet the requirements. Um, it's really, it's just, um, making sure that those calculations are are cleaned up in the end. The only other question I had was in regards to the parking. Um, so it is noted that there are um, currently two parking spaces for the property. I believe one is in a garage under the house. And is the other in the driveway that's common with the adjacent property? So it's it's actually not com yes so it's it's not common it's like the other house is very close to the lot line mm -hmm. so that where you see that ten foot um, on the left side that's all asphalt so there okay. is a parking space there as well as well as in front of the garage you know the garage is one of those um, tiny little garages that yeah is not made for cars of today <laughs> <laughs> right but the but none of the the required parking is not within the front yard correct. Excellent. Okay. Yep. Um, okay. Um, so with that, are there other questions, comments from the board?
do not see any. Um, that being the case, we'll go ahead um, and open this hearing for public comment. Uh, public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing its decision. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the reactions tab in the Zoom application. If you're calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you'd like to speak. You'll be called upon by the chair, asked to give your name and address of the record and given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please do remember to speak clearly. Are there members of the public who wish to address um, this hearing, which is the application for 109 Wright Street? Do not see any members of the public who are having raised their hand or waving in a window. So I will assume that there are no members of the public who wish to speak to this. So I will go ahead and close the public comment period uh, for this specific hearing. Um, so what the board does have before it um, is an application for a special permit for a large addition under 542B6. Um, this house has several nonconformities. Um, the uh, for the five four two B six, it's not creating any new nonconformities. Um, it is just the the large addition, which has um, the own findings it needs to make. Um, and then the other question has to do with um, the intent to. Uh, essentially pad out the front of the house um, in order to have the front facade not be just um, sort of a flat surface. Uh, let me go back and reshare. Um, so the, at the basement level, um, so this is the existing front of the house. Um, at the first floor, they are proposing to um, extend what it would effectively be from the, if I'm reading this correctly, the front wall of the office remains in line with the existing foundation wall. Um, what is the dimension of this dashed overhang here? Do it's you about know? eight inches. So, about... you know, and I just did seven inches, but we could make it four. You know, it doesn't have to be seven. It's just mm -hmm. I need a little bit like a corner board width to, to have it not just look like it's stuck on. But so mm -hmm. the existing overhang in the front and back is about eight inches or seven and a half. Okay. So, uh, if, you know, you guys could tell me if, tell us if you need it to be less or more, or, you know, whatever it would be to fit. So there's no foundation to it, but it does need to be two stories. So. Yeah. So does this, so this dashed line here in front of the office, when we go to the second floor, is that the now overhead. the front wall of the bedroom? Correct. Okay. Um. And so then, as you see here, there's no additional interior space gained by this addition. It's really, it's with the exception of just right in front of the window, essentially, but uh -huh. um, uh -huh. it's sort of de minimis at that point. Um, and here it's just more of a window seat than, I believe, is that a window seat? Is that how you're? Yeah, it's just a windowsill, um, okay. you know, because because we're basically leaving the, we're not touching anything on the inside. So it'll just where the windows are, it'll just be a deeper, like almost like a window bay. Okay. So we're not changing the floor or, or the ceilings or anything else. It'll just be a box. Then in the zoning bylaw, uh, so under 539, projecting eaves, chimneys, bay windows, balconies, open fire escapes, porches, and enclosed entrances not more than 25 square feet and floor area are more than one story high, which do not project more than three and one half feet beyond the line of the foundation wall may extend beyond the minimum yard regulations otherwise provided for the district in which the structure was built. Porches and enclosed entrances larger than that allowed above may be extended 
may extend into the minimum yard regulations otherwise provided. So what is being proposed, um, it is more than one story, um, but effectively it doesn't really have any floor area. Um, but it does extend into the front yard setback. So I would be interested in talking among the board what your sense is in regards to whether we can consider this request as falling under 539 or whether it is something it is outside the purview of 539, which would make it have to be a variance. Now, one thing to consider is a set, uh, subsection C, that second story additions within the required front yard setback may extend no more than one foot beyond the existing building wall. So where the applicant has stated that the lowest level of the house, which is the typically would be considered the basement level, they are considering that a story. So that would make the first floor um, the sec effectively the second story. So we could we consider C to be functional so long as the com none of, so that the setback um, so to extend no more than one foot beyond the existing building wall. So as they as the the applicant has stated, it's probably already an eight inch overhang. So if they were to overhang by additional four inches, that would therefore extend by no more than one foot. Um, and that floor from the second would floor. see qualify because it's technically the second story, even though it's the first floor of the house. Uh -huh. That could work. Members of the board think. M Mr. Chair. Mr. Riccadelli. I, you know, I think that makes sense to me where, where there's no, you know, actionable added square footage for living space. Um, if it feels to me that if we were to um, limit the projection to one foot uh, based on this statute that you just read, um, that there's, you know, no risk of that being a big problem because we're not really expanding uh, or they're not proposing to expand the house in any significant way. So it feels like that meets the spirit of this regulation. Um, so I, I would feel comfortable with that. Any other thoughts from the board on this? Mr. Chair. Mr. Holly. So this this um, item C says second story addition, right? I mean, not yeah. second and above. Um, because, you know, the basement is a first floor. Mm -hmm. Is, you know, or is it written that way that it is second and above? Or is it just... You know? well, I think... That's how I think sort of typically where you see this is sort of the garrison style houses. Um, but some of them do have the gable towards the street, in which case it doesn't like the attic floor doesn't step back in that it would continue to the roof line. Right. But here it's a, it's a third floor. I mean, by, mm -hmm. I mean, it is a three story residential non-conforming right correct yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry uh, I, get, I didn't cut you off but um 
you know, because it is not adding living square footage, in, in my mind, the reason why that makes it easier in my mind is because bays, bay windows, for instance, would be allowed uh, because they are not uh, additional living space and they um, are excluded from building area in that way. Um, so in, in my mind, these are all this, the same thing. We're padding out the exterior um, portion of a wall, but not adding living space. So it feels that it, that it is still meeting the spirit of that code regulation. Yeah, I would I would agree there, Mr. Chair. Um it does. Thank you. Other comments from the board? So in this case, it, it does look like the we will the variance is not required. Um but well, we do have the variance application in front of us. So um, I would ask the applicant if they would um, consider withdrawing uh, their variance requests uh, without prejudice. Um, and then we can focus on the special permit. Sounds good. So I would like to request to remove the variance application without prejudice. Thank you very much. So um, then I would uh, request a motion from the board that the uh, variance application for 109 Wright Street be with the, be withdrawn without prejudice. The chairman second, I think basically what we're doing is agree is agreeing with the uh, request of the, Consenting to the request of the applicant to to uh, withdraw the withdraw the application. That is correct, and that's what I move. Um, so with that, uh, just a roll call vote of the board. This is to accept the withdrawal of the variance application for one hundred nine Wright Street. Uh, Mr. Dupont, aye. Mr. Hanlon, aye. Mr. Holly, aye. Mr. Riccadelli, aye. Chair votes aye. That is withdrawn. That leaves us with the special permit application in front of the board. Um, so in order to uh, approve a large addition, uh, the board needs to um, grant a special permit, which has the required findings, which we'll get to in a second. But there are three additional findings that are required for a large addition. The first is that the alteration or addition is in harmony with other structures and uses in the vicinity. Um, the addition is a rear yard addition um, that is being requested. It is not substantially larger than um, other structures in the vicinity. It maintains the single family use um, and uh, allows um, the applicants to continue to enjoy their home. Um, the second finding is that the board must consider the dimensions and setbacks in relation to abutting structures and uses. Um, as the applicant noted, um, this is a, they're not just um, extending the, the lot lines uh, going back. They are stepping them in slightly to make sure that they're not uh, coming closer to the site, the side lot lines than the house is existing. Um, and the uh, house is only extending um, an additional 17 feet towards the rear, and it's a very substantially long lot. So um, in relation to uh, budding structures on the neighboring lots, although the neighboring lots are only half as deep as theirs, um, it does not um, appear to be overly large um, or overly close to other properties in the area. And we're supposed to consider the conformity with the purposes of the bylaw. Um, which as we said before, is to preserve open land, to uh, allow for air and light, uh, and to allow for an orderly expansion of the town and an orderly expansion of the tax base. Um, and this, I would I would put forward to the board that I believe that this project does that, um, which would then bring us to the required findings for a special permit. 
Uh, the first is that the adverse effects of the proposed use will not outweigh its beneficial impacts. Um, it is an existing use uh, of a single family in a single family district. Um, the proposed use of additional interior space in the house will not be does not outweigh the beneficial um, does does not have adverse effects that would outweigh the beneficial impact. Uh, the requested use is allowed or allowed by special permit in the district. Uh, this is allowed under um, 532B6. Uh, um, I would also note that under 539C, uh, the expansion in the front yard would be allowed. Um, but as we have discussed, that would actually be allowed by right. Um, the requested use is essential or desirable to the public convenience or welfare. Uh, this allows the, the family that's a part of this neighborhood to remain in this neighborhood and to, um, in, to more fully enjoy their property um, and allows for an orderly expansion of the, the tax base, which is a benefit to the town in general. Requested use will not create undue traffic congestion or impair pedestrian safety. Uh, there is no, uh, the changes to the front of the house are of such a minor condition that they have no impact whatsoever on uh, sight lines leaving or entering the property. Um, it will not overload any public system. Uh, this is, it remains a single family house. It's just slightly larger uh, while the, the the water and septic usage and the electricity usage will increase. It will not increase to such an extent that it would uh, cause um, any undue concern. Special regulations for the requested use are fulfilled. Uh, we did those initially. Those were those three findings under large additions. Um, the requested use will not impair the character or integrity of the district. Uh, this is a, a well-considered uh, addition to the house. And as that was said by the um, by the applicant during their presentation, that uh, the intent with the uh, very thin front addition is to improve the the appearance of the house and, and not in any way attempting to increase the interior space of the house, um, which go, just sort of, uh, I think, lends to that uh, sense that they're trying to improve the, the character and integrity of the house and the district. Uh, requested use will not be detrimental to public health or welfare. Um, it will just remain a single family house and the requested use will not cause an excess of the use detrimental to the neighborhood. Uh, which it would not as being a single family in a single family district. Um, those are the required findings, both for the large addition and for the special permit. Are there any questions from the board in regards to the findings that the board needs to make? Seeing none, uh, we'll move us on to conditions. Oh. Mr. Yes? Chair, sorry. Mr. Holly, yeah. Um. So on the building height as a number of stories, yeah, it's still it's it is three stories, right? Um, it is a, a pre-existing three-story house, but not established anywhere in the property documents, but established based on the definitions and applied by a professional, right, as a surveyor or an architect in this so case. We I, I think that would be something that we should um, condition is that the, the applicant provide um, confirmation that the property is in fact a pre-existing three-story structure. Right. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. I wonder if, if the applicant could, uh, I mean, one quick way is when was this building built? Uh, that's Ms. a good Rick, question. I know? may have to defer to the homeowners. Um, I know a second story was added onto it years back. Um, so it, originally it was a one story. Um, Eric and Jess, can you answer the how old the house is? Yeah, I believe the original interface from same time. So I'm quite, at least for me, that didn't come through very clearly. No. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So it wouldn't, I mean, unless you know, if this was not originally a three story, then the question is whether is, I mean, it, it does have to be a prior nonconformity in the sense that it has to be a nonconformity that, that existed prior to the time when the regulation that prevented going up uh, to, th uh, to more than two and a half stories uh, was adopted. And so at this point, the record is bare of any evidence on that. No. So, so he's saying. I just was looking. Um, so it 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 was in the nineteen fifties that the second story was added, or a third story, yeah. if if you will, to the house. So it was a, a, quite a while ago. Okay. okay, it's relatively easy to get the 1956 version of the zoning bylaw, and I think that that would be a good start to figuring out whether or not there's a there's a potential issue here. But I guess it, at this point, my my effort to try to advance this during the hearing is is failing, and so I guess we should just leave that to a condition. But it's an important condition. Yes. If it is if it isn't met, then you don't have a prior nonconforming use, and you're and that's a Harding difficult problem. Mm -hmm. So for conditions, I was going to recommend this standard three, which we've previously read into the record this evening, and then I was going to recommend one that the applicant is to provide documentation substantiating the status of the house as an existing nonconforming three-story building. I think that's clear and direct. Um, and then the other condition was that um, the overhang at the second story is limited to 12 inches per section by three nine C. Um, and that's more belt and suspenders, but just that the, the seven inches indicated on the plan um, is going to have to be reduced so that overall it doesn't exceed 12 inches. That's uh, fine. Which, which is allowed to be go forward. Are there Sounds any good. are there any other conditions that the board would want to impose on this application? Seeing none, um, so the board had in reviewing the findings, there's been no objection to the finding that the all the uh, required findings for the special permit and for the large addition have been met. Um, and five conditions have been put forward um, in regards to um, those findings. Uh, so at this point, unless there's further comment from the board, I think the board is ready to, uh, the chair would accept a motion to close the public hearing uh, for docket 3806-109 Wright Street. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Um, Mr. Hanlon, you, you and I can uh, prepare a um a decision um, in favor of the application for voting at our next hearing. That sounds great. Thank you. Um, and then, so a vote of the board to close uh, this public hearing. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye. This hearing is closed. Thank you all very much. Thank you.
Thank you. With that, we will return to the last, our agenda for the last item, which is uh, docket 380739 Amherst Street. Um, if I could ask the applicant to go ahead and introduce themselves and tell us what they are proposing. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. My name is Vahe Ohanesian. I'm the architect and contractor for this project. And in the meeting are also the homeowners, Mr. Scott Smith and his wife, Karen Steiner, um, and my assistant, Karin Sitholm from uh, my office. Uh, this uh, project entails a one-story addition in an R2 district single family at 39 Amherst. And the uh, relief we're seeking is simply that the there is nowhere existing on the property um, open space that meets the 25 by 25 requirement. So the existing has none and the proposed obviously uh, with the addition uh, creates less open space, even though by the definition there is none. Um, I know there was some question about possibly their existing uh, 25 by 25 space uh, between the garage and the house on the Rawson roadside, this being a corner lot between uh, Amherst and Rawson. <clears throat> However, we clarified just today after seeing your, your notes that we received from Colleen, Mr. Chairman, um, that there's a small overhanging landing at the back of the house that actually is not existing open space because it's not open to the sky. And that actually creates a space that's less than 25 by 25. So there's really nowhere on the lot where there is an existing 25 by 25 open space. Um, the purpose of the addition is uh, to create a master suite for uh, the homeowners. Uh, and in particular, Mr. Smith uh, has a physical disability and going up and down the stairs every day is getting more and more difficult. And so that's the main purpose of this addition. Uh, so we'll go ahead and just need to actually open the application first. One second. So these are the proposed plans. Correct. Uh, these were actually uploaded today after we made a, a, a third revision to the plans uh, in okay. response to your comments. Okay, so this is, yeah, this is that version. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so the question that we had posed about the usable open space. So to be usable open space, it has to be, uh, an area that is 25 by 25, or I should say 25 feet on each side, um, and is at least 75% open to the sky. So the question that we were trying to figure out um, was, we understand that there's it's twenty one nine from the essentially this front the front edge of the covered portion of the porch to the to Rawson. and it's twenty one feet from again the sort of similar point to the garage. But the bylaw seems to imply that it should actually be the back corner that we need to consider. Um, and so then the question is, do we, is it, is it 25 feet from this surface here to the garage? And is it 25 feet from this surface up here to the property line? Um, 
I believe the one from Rawson Road uh, to the house is slightly over 25 feet. Okay. Um, I'm not 100% sure on the other one, but I was not aware of this 75% open to the sky mm -hmm. criteria. So uh, this is new to me as okay. of this point. Yeah, no, but it's part of, it's part of the, the definition in the, in the zoning bylaw for usable open space. Okay. Um, so this is something that the board is going to have to discuss as to whether they feel that there is usable open space on the property um, today or whether we should accept that it's that, that there is not usable open space on the property as it stands. Uh, but I'll continue to go through the site. Uh, the set, excuse me. Um, so these are visions of the of the property, uh, both showing existing and proposed. Uh, so this is just a simple expansion in the direction of the existing garage, um, existing basement plan with the existing sunroom that's uh, on the side facing Amherst Street. Um, basement plan so the new addition is going to be on on piles rather than on, on a foundation um, and with demolition at the first floor level so the existing deck uh landing cover porch and portions of the existing wall would be removed um, which would allow the creation of a new entrance on the side um, laundry area and then a, really a first floor suite uh, for the enjoyment of the property owner. Um, and then at the second floor level, uh, the existing roof that covers the small addition that's there now and the covered entry that would be removed um, and replaced with uh, a metal roof um, sloping in the direction of the garage. That's the main roof. Uh, so this so it gives a better sense from the the Rawson Street view um, of what's coming off in the proposal. Um, and the other views as well. Um, one question I had on this elevation. Um, there's a variety of different window types. Um, one of which seems to sort of uh, um, sort of have some agreement with what is currently on the building. I'm curious as to whether um, it would be possible for this smaller window. I understand this window here is in the shower, so it obviously can't be modified. Right. Um, but would it be possible for this window to be extended so that you at least have a sort of more uniformity with the the existing exterior of the house. That happens to be right in front of a uh, bench and some hooks ah. for what's a very, very small mudroom, not even a room, it's just a wall space. Because of the tight, you know, it, we're trying to fit a lot in a small space mm -hmm. um, and also trying to make it future, you know, wheelchair accessible in some ways, as you okay. can imagine. And so that's the, that's the reason for that window being high. But you know, if the board insists, then we can certainly change it, and we'll have to live with it. <laughs> okay. um, and then we have just that's second. behind the bed, and that's behind the bedboard facing the neighbors, not really visible. Right. Um, and then the rest of it's mostly construction related. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the larger question before the board um, I think really has to do with this, this question of whether they have usable open space. Obviously, if they don't have existing usable open space, the additional gross floor area does not need to be accommodated. Um, it would be fairly straightforward. This addition is not large enough to qualify. I believe it's not big enough to be a a, a large addition. Correct. Yeah, I think um, it's 417. Yeah. This, 
so I think my question to the board would be, does the, are they comfortable with the, the statement that it doesn't meet usable open space or do they think that the calculation for usable open space should include this corner by the definition for usable open space that's in the bylaw? I can find here. So usable open space, part or parts of a lot designed and developed for outdoor use by the occupants of the lot for recreation, including swimming pools, tennis courts, or similar facilities, or for gardener for household service activities such as clothes drying, which space is at least 75% open to the sky, free of automotive traffic and parking, and readily accessible by all those for whom it is required. Such space may include open area accessible to and developed for the use of the occupants of the building and located upon a roof not more than 10 feet above the level of the lowest story. Open space shall be deemed usable only if at least 75% of the area has a grade of less than 8% and no horizontal dimension is less than 25 feet. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. What is that little corner that's chopped off there used for now? I noticed that in the in the instruction in the um, definition, the first sentence seems to and I don't have it up anymore because I was looking <laughs> at your at your screen, but it, it has to do that is for the purpose of you know a, a certain kind of use. And I'm wondering what's there now. So this is uh, to the perspective view looking at that corner of the house. So this is the, the existing deck, um, which extends to the house and has a landing leading to the door. So this is corner is open um, and is part of deck stairs and the landing to the rear door of the house. So there would be no reason if, if the rest of the deck is using will open space what would be the reason why this corner wouldn't be? It can't be that it's covered because it, the whole the question has to do actually with the whole thing, whether it's 75% open to the sky, and this doesn't trigger right. that. So what would be the reason for distinguishing that area in front of the door from the rest of the deck area, which we think would be usable open space, or at least that I think that we would think that. I mean, my concern is my concern is I don't think we can. I, I I think by the definition, it does need to be included in the calculation for usable open space, which may in this case lead to um, you know there being usable open space on this property. And then the question becomes, you know, what are the dimensions? of it, how much is there, and how do we, how do we move forward and not create a new nonconformity? This case would be far simpler if this was not considered part of usable open space, but unfortunately I think by the definition it's required to be considered usable open space. If it is considered usable open space, Mr. Chairman, do we have, um, I, I, I don't have in my head the, the square footages, does it, is it sufficient? usable open space to be 30% of the gross floor area of the existing building. Well, if it's 25 by 25, it'll be 625 square feet. Um, six hundred twenty-five square feet divided by 0.3. So that would substantiate that would be enough for 2080 square feet of gross floor area.
and the existing gross floor area is listed as 2010. Well, that's not good. No. But if it's if it's really two thousand, if it's really just twenty five by twenty five, then they're looking at. Unfortunately, they'd be limited to like seventy three square feet of addition, which is really unfortunate. Are there two criteria for uh, defining usable open space? One is the size and the 75% open to the sky, and the other is the percentage of GFA at 30. So in the table of use, um, in the R1 district, uh, the minimum usable open space is 30%. And it's 30% of the gross floor area of the house. So if the if it's more than 25 by 25, if it feels like you know 25 by 25 and a half. Then 21, then the number jumps up to 2125 for the amount of space you're allowed to have. So So, but doesn't it mean that it does not qualify as existing open space as it stands now? So currently, uh, go back if it is so at two thousand ten, thirty percent of that is six hundred three. So as long as the usable open space is more than 603, it's compliant. Um, and if it's 25 feet on a side, then that would be you know, arguably six, or 625 square feet, so it would comply. What else can we do here? Um, I would like to measure the actual distance between the garage and the front door, see if it's yeah. actually over 25. I mean, the rear door facing right. the garage. Yeah. Right. And if that's not 25, then we don't have There is no usable open space. And right. It's, it becomes a very simple operation again. I mean, if, if it is, it's a matter of a couple of inches. Mm -hmm. if, if, if I, I didn't specifically measure that dimension, but if it is there, then it's, you know, within a couple of inches of being at 25. So, yeah, so I, I would recommend that you determine what those dimensions definitively are. And then talk to the building inspector and see what we could possibly do to try to remedy the situation. Um, so if they, if by that definition we measure and whatever we find, talk to him, if there is no existing open space. If you don't qualify for usable open, open space, space, then we're, then what the board has before it is, um, you know, an existing non-conformity or increasing the non-conforming nature of the non-conformity and the board just needs to make a determination that it's not substantially more detrimental. Um, 
But if you do have the usable open space, then to proceed with this plan, you would need to apply for a variance because we're you would be creating a new nonconformity. Unless the building inspector, as the town zoning official, interprets it differently. Mr. Chair. Mr. Riccadelli. Can I just add a clarifying um, point for the applicant? Uh, it has been our uh, interpretation uh, in conjunction with the town that um, decks, because I, I believe there's a deck off this back portion of the house, uh, because they're open to the sky, do qualify as usable open space. So um, like the chair is saying, uh, you know, that one covered little corner uh, would still not equate to 25% of of the area that we're talking about. So we'd be basically asking you to measure over the deck because uh, that would that would be included in this case. Mr. Yeah, Chairman. So it would be this shape that we would need to that might possibly yes. be 25 by 25. Right. Well, Mr. Hanlon? We just suggest that that uh, the applicants, to, to, uh, I would just go first to Mr. Champa and lay out the problem with him and follow his guidance on how to do the measurements and 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 you know what he wants i wouldn't sort of go out and do them and then say where well, you make these numbers so uh you know mr champa's uh, understands a lot about how all this stuff works and if there's a solution somewhere here uh he may be able to help you find it okay yeah i'm sorry that's not the not the way you were hoping this would go. Certainly not. Uh, may I ask, uh, depending on which way that yep. conversation goes with the uh, commissioner, mm -hmm. what, what would be what would we be looking at uh, next in each? So we scenario? would. So we would can we would recommend that we um, continue until July twenty third. So we just for two weeks. Um which would be our next hearing. And then we could continue with the discussion of this case. And um, within that time, you should have a chance to talk to Mr. Champa about um, what your options are. And then uh, hopefully it's something pretty simple and you come back to us on the 23rd uh, with an application that um, <clears throat> and some definition as to what we're doing. Um, otherwise, um, if you need additional time, you can request it, um, at that point, but I'm hoping that sort of this, this intervening two weeks is enough time to sort of clarify everything and, and come up with a, with a way to move forward. That is enough time for me to, to do that. Um, is there any way of getting some guidance or a couple of minutes of discussion here? If this was to be a variance, just in case, which... Yep. We'll see everything we can to, to not go there, but if it does, yeah. um, in hearing the previous cases, um, especially the one on Washington Street, I believe, mm -hmm. what are the chances that you, you know um, there's some uniqueness to this site that makes it right. financially um, uh, hardship and so forth, especially given um, yeah. the reason why we're doing this in the first place, as I mentioned earlier. Right. No, absolutely. Um... My sense is the first thing that building inspector is going to ask is if you can live without your garage. Um, because that's an easy way to gain back space. Uh, but that's not, that's often not very practical. Um, as we had discussed for the variance, I mean, there's the four tests. The first is, is there something about the soil shape or topography of this site? 
that affects and creates a hardship on this property that is not general to the district as a whole. Um, you know, and as we had discussed on the Washington Street case, there were specific conditions related to the soils because of the, the existing trees and the slope on the site. This is a very flat site. Uh, um, there's really, you know, you would have to make your make a case to the board that the board can make that finding that there is something about the soil shape or topography of the site leading to a hardship. Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hamlin, if I could just add one thing that that we don't usually have to come up with, but that is important, is that the kind of consideration that we have to take into place is not is not allowed to take into consideration the you can do the the unique conditions of the applicant i mean for example if you said somebody needed needs a, a variance in order to uh in order to provide for somebody i don't know retiring presidents over 88 point or something like that the uh that wouldn't be allowed to count because it's unique to the owner of the property or the or, or the user of the property, you, the a variance is something that has to go with the land, and that would be a, an issue for anyone. So, uh, that that makes I mean that that makes the the problem I think for us a little bit a little bit harder. Uh, we don't we're not quite as as restricted on special permits, but here everything has to be touched and related to the land and and not to the individual circumstances of whoever happens to be owning it at any one time. So one quirky question for you. Um, is the, what, what is the roof on the garage today? Is it a, is it a pitched roof or is it a flat roof? It is a pitched roof. Okay. And it's a metal tile. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's a hip. It's a hip roof metal tile. Because one other thought is usable open space is allowed to extend onto a roof not more than 10 feet above grade. And so if the garage had a flat roof, you could potentially consider the space behind the garage in conjunction with the flat roof of the garage as usable open space. And that may be something that the building inspector would agree to. In other words, that would come into the calculation of the proposed conditions. Right. So if you so you just have to have the usable open space. It doesn't have to be the same usable open space you have today. So if you were to be able to create an alternative spot on the site that met the requirements, then you could proceed with that. Um, and oftentimes what the building department will, will recommend is they'll say, well, what, just get rid of the garage, have parking out on the out in the weather, and then you're fine. You know, you can cut back on the size to get the space. But here, where if you want to keep the garage, it might be possible because I believe the site rises as it moves away from Rawson Road, that you could have the, you know, even if it was just like the rear portion of the garage, having a flat roof as opposed to uh pitched roof that was a flat roof with like you know, that you could occupy as a deck that might meet the requirement for usable open space and then you would be able to do your addition as you want it's I'm just sorry just to be clear are you suggesting a partial flat roof on the garage or i mean just or you know you could do a flat roof over the whole garage um but yeah i mean we're both architects uh okay. it would be quite awkward to have a partially yeah, flat it would be <laughs> <laughs> It would be, but it would, but if it, but you can see what I mean. Like if you had a deck that was on top of the garage that was close to the ground, that was, you know, it can be within 10 feet. So if you had a deck up there, that would meet the requirements. 
or just a flat roof without a deck because the deck would require you know a stair or connection then that, yeah. the garage becomes uh, attached to the building in that case yeah you know you, that would be a conversation to have with the inspector as to what you know what what level of finish you would need to have in order to qualify Okay. Those are the those are the ones that readily come to mind. This is a, a long shot, but let me ask you one other question. If we were to make the addition a flat roof, mm -hmm. actually have a connection to a flat roof on the or just a connection to the garage, say like a cover, extend the roof just enough to mm -hmm. connect with the garage to cover it. I think it creates new non-conformances for the garage because it's now an accessory building. Whereas if we connect it to the main house, even with a breezeway roof, it becomes part of the main structure, but right. it changes the whole, whole gross floor area calculation. Um, because now the garage would be included if I understand the ordinance correctly. Because now it's no longer an accessory building, but I'm not sure that as I think, think through this, I'm not sure that that would help because it's the existing condition that we're battling here. Right. And the so for the purposes of gross for area calculation, areas used for accessory parking are excluded from the calculation. So I, I was a bit confused on that because whether the garage is attached to the house or detached, it doesn't change its function. It right. does change the definition of the building itself, but not the use of the of that portion. Right. So parking so, garages, parking garages count unless they're being used for accessory parking, in which case they don't count. I don't understand why it was written this way. Um, so is, is this single is this detached garage considered access uh, um, accessory parking? Um, so it's an accessory building, but it's considered. Right. Accessory parking yes. to primary parking. I believe so, because it's required parking. So it's a parking that's accessory. It's accessory parking because it's accessory to the use of the property as opposed to like a rental garage. Okay. Which would not be accessory. It would be primary. Yeah. Okay, so this is accessory parking to the house, but it, would it be the same if it was attached or detached? My sense is it shouldn't matter either way, but I would highly strongly encourage you to talk to the building inspector. Okay. So I understand the conclusion is we're going to continue to the next hearing. That'll buy us a couple of weeks to speak with the commissioner and see what solution we can come up with. Unless anyone else can think of a loophole for us. <laughs> Mr. Chair. Mr. Canelli. Can I just offer one, one other thought? At, um, yeah. Stemming from the flat roof discussion. So, um, so that that section is written as it's ten feet from the lowest story used for dwelling purposes. Oh, okay. So it's not the the ground. Right. Um, so if potentially the addition that was proposed was ten feet, you know, from the 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 finished floor to the top, and the roof of the addition being proposed was flat, oh. and could qualify as uh, usable open space, then potentially the usable open space could just be in the same spot that it might be in right now. Once once we get the measurements, uh, if you know if the building inspector would would agree with that approach, that's a great thought. Thanks very much. I appreciate the idea. That's exactly what I was asking for. If any other um, avenues could be pursued. Uh, Mr. Riccardelli, uh, is it possible procedurally to ask if we did that, how would the board respond? 
I mean, I think we would need to see it. Correct. Uh, to know. Um, but if you, you know, take a look at the idea, talk to the inspector, the inspector says, yep, that makes sense. Then, you know, then you're, you have existing usable open space, you're providing usable open space. Um, as long as you meet the numbers. In fact, the, theoretically, the, the, you may not need a special permit anymore if you do it right. You may be able to do it by right. Okay, so if we did a uh, flat roof, yep. Um, there's the existing small pitched roof where the kitchen bumps out in the back. Yep. That's currently too steep to be counted as flat and open to the sky. Yep. because of the pitch but if we did a flat roof in fact the new open space area would be more than the existing because that little portion would in fact become flat um less than the one eighth pitch and um open to the sky of course mm -hmm. so by that definition i think we would potentially be increasing the open space overall or at least maintaining it, yeah. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon? It's one of the person, I mean, usually this is coming up in an odd way because we started off thinking that this was a zero open space to zero open space kind of case. And it's turning out to be not as simple as that. But our usual course is that we, we tee off the the finding of the, of the building inspector mm -hmm. so i i could say that if if whatever you brought back and and i don't it can be far more imaginative than i am am and it would be fine if the building inspector said it was fine and so in in that sense you know we start first with what the judgment of the building department is and if that's I mean, as it's been pointed out, if if it, under certain circumstances that means may mean you never have to see us again, mm -hmm. uh, and and that would be fine too. But I mean, no, I mean, we, we, you're welcome anytime you like. But I think that that the key thing that you need to do is is confer with the building inspector and find a solution. If he agrees, then the chances are at least some of us on the board will agree, and the chances are that you may not even need us to agree. Uh, and on the other hand, if he doesn't agree and you're asking us to sort of make a finding that is that disagrees with him, then obviously that's a much more difficult task for you to do. Understood. So, so thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Go ahead. Mr. Chair. Um, yes, Mr. Ali. Sorry not to beat a dead horse here. That um, including open, I'm just reading the definition again mm -hmm. for the accessible to and developed for the use of the occupants of the building located upon a roof. Mm -hmm. So accessible to is, yeah. So that needs so to be brought. Be. Yeah. would need some kind of a access yeah, to I that. I think it's going to be a, a usable deck accessible off the second floor. Is that what we're getting at? I, well, yeah. Mm hmm not through the exterior stair, you know, somehow getting an access for the occupants to be used, you know. Right, right. right. Of the building, yeah. Okay. So where was that section, just so I'm clear? I think it's in the definition itself, correct? It's a definition, yeah, page, yeah open yeah. space, comma, usable. Yeah, it goes from page 20 to 21. It's on page 19. Depends which work, yeah. Yeah, PDF of that, yeah. 2 dash 13. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I th think the applicant has a path to um, consider how they're going to move forward. And we have, uh, so I think the board can vote to continue. Um, so I would ask for a motion to continue the public hearing for docket 3807 at 39 Amherst Street until Tuesday, July 23rd, 2024 at 7.30 p.m. So moved to Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Mr. DuPont on the second. 
Yes. Thank you. Uh, so roll call vote of the board to continue uh, this public hearing. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are continued on uh, 39 Amherst Street. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate your patience. Sorry we weren't able to, um, to do more for you this evening. I think we had a potential new solution, but thank you very much. Appreciate it. Have a good night, Thanks everyone. For Thanks good for the thoughtfulness. You're very, very welcome. Take care. Uh, so that is the end of the items on our agenda. Um, as we just noted, at the next hearing of the board is Tuesday, July 23rd at 7.30. Um, are there any members who are away on the 23rd? Oh, um, and then after that will be August 13th, August 27th, and then September 10th. Um, I would ask uh, Colleen, do we, what is on our agenda already for the 23rd? On um, the 23rd, we have um, 314 Mass Ave, it's a front porch, and 22 Lawrence Lane, I believe, which is also a front porch. Uh, and then the one that we've added tonight. And that is it. Oh, great. Yes. Nice. Okay. Um, and I think at the next hearing, um, I'm going to put forward a recommended vote to the board, uh, which we should make sure we, we include in the um, in the notice for the meeting. Um, this evening, Mr. Hanlon added a piece to each that allows the chair to sign on behalf of the board. I think we're we're going to put together a vote for the board uh, to do it on a blanket basis for all hearings, uh, for all decisions until the next election for chair. So um, we don't have to do that for each individual vote we take, but we'll just do it, the vote once to authorize the chair to sign on behalf and then um, We'll just do that until we until it's time to vote for new chair, which is in April. Hey, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, just to just to remind us is that given what we've already done, there's at least one administrative change that needs to be made to the to one of the cases. But all of them are going to need to have the names of the people who vote who voted. Uh, put in in the chair's certificate. So it can't be sort of instantaneously produced the way we have been doing before. Uh, so we need to hold on long enough to to get the the things finished. It, I mean, it'll take minutes rather than hours, but right. uh, but we do need to make sure that we don't we don't send it off too fast. Okay. So I will go ahead and fix the one for Mystic. So that is ready in its final form. Um, Pat, can you grab the other two? I'm sorry, I read the other two. No, can you can you do the other two? Yes, I will. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, unless there's anything else. Uh, Mr. Chair, can I make a comment? Mr. Moore. Um, a comment and an observation. I, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, in your meetings tonight, uh, or that that particular case uh, we were talking about the rare large tree earlier. Um, you spoke of, or the board spoke of, uh, trees as a public good. And I want to thank the board for that. Mm -hmm. That sort of language is the type of language we need to start considering here. And I think it's uh, it's broadly supported by the town. And uh, in, in terms of that part of the consideration of that particular decision, I think that was important. So I just wanted to highlight and applaud that. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Appreciate that. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I would especially like to thank Colleen Ralston, uh, Mike Champa, Mike Cunningham, and Jacqueline Munson for their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. And especially like to to thank Michael Cunningham for staying with us tonight and, uh, and providing his guidance. 
Please note the purpose of the board's recording the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It's our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So vote of the board to adjourn. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Mr. LeBlanc. Aye. And the chair votes aye. The board is adjourned. Thank you all so very much. We'll see you all in two weeks. Good night, Good night, Good night everyone. Good night, everybody. Good night. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.